Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I've titled the message, Releasing Jesus, or Release Jesus, however you would prefer to say it. And the subtitle, as you can see here, is The Day Jesus Said No. We're going to explain that next week. The day that Jesus said no. How important that day was in the message that he was sharing with us. To begin with, I want to show you a chart. And uh, I put this together. It's a, it's a short rendition of the much bigger one that we hope to show you next week and show you at least a picture of it next week. So what I've done is I've extracted from a much greater uh, chart that I've put together over the years on end time events. And <clears throat> I think what's happening in our news right now is bringing us very close to the rapture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly walk you through this, and then we're going to go back and read some scripture. But we're, we're living right here. We're, we're in this time span. We're really, really close to the rapture at this point. And I'll explain that as we move along. And then, as you know, there's the seven-year tribulation period. And I know there's the, what's called the pre-tribulation rapture, the mid-tribulation rapture, and the post-tribulation rapture over here. There's actually five theories of the rapture existing. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one there. There's one, two, three, four, five that exist. We covered all of this on Sunday nights uh, three years, four years ago. For a year and a half, we spent Sunday nights studying the uh, revelations and end time events. And so we explained these five raptures that people uh, contend for. It is the basic held view of, at least in the in Assemblies of God and many other denominations as well. And uh, I, I'm still a very strong uh, rapture believer. And of course, one thing we want to get straight with you right off the bat, it, it really, what really matters is, are we ready? That's what really matters the most. Whatever view you choose, if you want six and seven, uh, oh, you can bring that back up. If you want six and seven views, that's, that's fine. But we got to be ready. And this is the goal of this two weeks. Are we ready? That's, that's a goal. Are we personally ready and do we have those around us ready? But in that first three and a half years, and by the way, Antichrist will make its presence known here. And three, I'm going to show you that. Three and a half years of peace and prosperity. Uh, the last three and a half years of sun destruction because this is where uh, a major change takes place. And we have the mark of the beast. As scripture talks about it being 666, man's number. And then we, somewhere in this time span, the war of Armageddon builds. It's not here. It's not necessarily there, but it's in this span here that the war of Armageddon takes place. And then, of course, the second coming of Christ, where Christ comes and sits down, puts his foot on the Mount of Olivet. It says, and then we live a thousand years, millennial. Satan is bound during the thousand years. Then he's let loose for one more uh, luhau, as they say, with all of his demons. We'll have one small period of time at the end of the thousand years. It would be the war of Gog and Magog where God's uh, angels and heavenly hosts will come down and will war against the demons and Satan. And then he will be cast along with the demons in the bombless pit forever and ever and ever. At which time, then the new heavens and the new earth arrive. You know, if, you, if you've ever been to Colorado Springs in that area, I said to the Lord one day, when I, and, and when I look at pictures on TV and I look at some of the beautiful things, we would like to listen to soundscapes and you see all these beautiful scenes and places around the world. I said to the Lord one day, Lord, how, how could the new heavens and earth be more beautiful than what we've got now? So imagine the new heavens and the new earth, what they're going to look like, what they're going to be like. But they're, they're coming. The new heavens and the new earth is coming. So now let's go back and let's, let's read this scripture here. We do want to take time to read this scripture today. In 1 Thessalonians, chapter 10, well, excuse me, chapter 1, let me get to that there. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 10, 
And they speak of how you look forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us. This is important. Who's rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. This, this is why there's a strong... You can stay on that if you don't mind, gentlemen. Thank you. It's not your fault. It's, I Thank you. That's why we have a strong view of the rapture is because of what these verses say. So let me read to you 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Why? Because when you read the book of Revelation, it begins, the, the, the judgments of God begins here. It be, they begin here. They don't start here. They begin here in this span. And I'm telling you, what is coming is the most horrific description. In fact, I dare say that most of you, and I don't want to insult anybody here today, I'm only saying this because what people tell me. So hear that clearly. I'm only saying what I'm going to say because of what people tell me. But listen very carefully. Most people I talk to have never read the book of Revelation. They're too scared to. Number one. And number two, they say, I can't understand it. That's the two things I hear the most. Well, it's, it's time to get scared. And it's time to read the book of Revelation. Because you're hearing a lot of things out there in the prophetic world that are incorrect. The Bible is always correct. Listen to me. The Bible is always correct. It is the final authority. I'm not saying don't listen to the prophetic wisdom that's out there. I'm saying compare it to Scripture, whatever you do. So anyways, let's, let's look at one more. Revelation 3.10. The, the Church of Philadelphia, this is when he spoke to the seven churches, chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. Well, here's chapter 3, and it's the Church of Philadelphia. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. This is the hour of trial. That hour didn't mean 60 minutes. It meant a time span. And it's during the seven-year tribulation. Who will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to, that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So, all right, so here we are. We're at this point right now in history. We're really close to the rapture. Now let's take a look at what Daniel says. This, this can be a little tricky sounding, but hang on. We're going to explain it to you. It says in Daniel chapter 9, 26, after this period... Of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing, and a ruler will rise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood, and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. When you read this verse, you get the impression that the crucifixion of Christ hasn't even happened yet. But the crucifixion of Christ did happen, and we did have the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. But so it, it did happen. The crucifixion did happen. But what this verse is really saying, this verse covers the, up to the crucifixion of Christ and all the way projected into the future. So what is that? Well, let's look at verse 27. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time... Now, that half this time is right here, half this time, seven years, three and a half, half its time, for a period of one set of seven, but after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings, as, and as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object. There's going to be an image of Antichrist of himself that will be set up in the temple in the middle of the tribulation period that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him, which, of course, will happen here in the War of Armageddon and will also happen here when he has his final doom. So in the middle of this tribulation period, Antichrist will set up an image of himself. Now, something to be, to be noted here. It's very, 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 very important. There is going to be a religious movement during the tribulation period. But Antichrist is going to be, and this is in the book of Revelation. We all studied this on Sunday nights. Those who was in my class, we studied this on Sunday nights. 
that even in the middle of the tribulation, when he sets himself up, he is going to become so angry, he's going to become so defiant, so wicked, so, so bad in his rulership that he is going to even destroy the organized religious church of that time. Now, that has nothing to do with people that will be saved during the tribulation period. There will be people saved because the two witnesses come on the scene and they witness and people come to the Lord. There will be people saved during the tribulation period. And I know the big question. I already know it. heard it a hundred times. I've studied this thing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and years and years of hours. I've heard the question, well, Pastor, do, if I don't make the rapture now, will I make it then? If I, if I don't make it now, can I make it then? Read Thessalonians. Because it says there in Thessalonians that God will cause a delusion to come upon the people who rejected him. He will cause a, a delusion to come upon them to believe the lies of Antichrist. So if a person rejects Jesus now, there's a good chance he definitely will reject Jesus then. Thinking you can have a second chance, be careful, because Jesus is going to bring a delusion upon the face of the earth for those who rejected him, who had a chance and rejected him, Thessalonians, and because of that, they will believe the lies of Antichrist. And, buddy, they'll take that mark of the beast in a heartbeat because they want to eat, because they want fuel for the car, because they need food for the kids. They need clothes to wear. They need to get to work. So be very, very careful, folks, that you play around with the things of God today. Make sure that you know that you know that you know that you are ready so that if you walk out this door and Jesus came today, you know where you're going. Don't be messing around thinking you've got time. Don't be messing around thinking you can just wait. Well, I'll get saved. I know what to do. Pastor told us on a Sunday morning, I know what to do to get saved. Not when God comes on the scene. It causes a delusion. So be careful. Well, this object, and in Daniel, well, in Daniel chapter 10, 14, it says, now, I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future. So what you're seeing in chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, is something that was a, for the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. And what we're saying today is that we're very close to that time. Here's Revelation 13, verses 4 through 6. It says, they worship the dragon for the giving of for giving the beast such power, the Antichrist such power. And they also worship the beast, the Antichrist, who is as great as the beast. Who? They exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? Then the beast will, was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God. And he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling, that is those who dwell in heaven. So this very, uh, he's going to come on the scene as caring, understanding. He's going to bring nations together. He's going to have the answer. It's going to make sense to people that this is the man, this is the person. He's going to be able to do miraculous signs and wonders that says in Scripture. He will have the ability to do miracles. It's going to cause people to believe that he is God. He's going to claim to be God, but in the middle it all falls apart. And the viciousness and the wickedness of his nature will come forth. And that's what Revelations here just said. Now, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy. It says in Revelations 1-3, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. For the time is near. Now, if time was near at the time he wrote this, John and the island of Patmos, if time was near then, how near are we now? And uh, why is it so important that we show you this chart? And I'm going to give you one reason why. is because, listen very carefully, we cannot stop what's coming. We can't stop it. There's not a thing I can think. There's not a thing I can say. There's not a thing I can read. In fact, the more I read the Bible, the more I see it coming together. Do you know something just happened recently in Russia that is an eye opener? Who just recently received passage for the oil? 
Russia. Do you ever wonder why Russia wants to control? Do you ever wonder why Russia wants Israel? He wants her oil. Russia can't exist without oil. He just got permission to have the oil now, passage. What three nations for sure right now, and there's more, but what three nations for sure in the news that are rising up right now against Israel? Russia, China, Iran. Who's been bombing Israel? And they had to use their dome to, you know, to reject the, the missiles. Iran. These nations, and the Bible says all nations will rise up against Israel. And the big question is, well, if um, if the United States is an ally to Israel, then what? where does it mean all nations? Well, it still can mean all nations, and we can still be an ally with Israel. But what is happening in America right now, with what's going on in America right now, is that America is being rendered powerless to do anything with anybody around the world. There's an insidious work of the enemy right now, an insidious work of the, with the enemy right now to make America powerless to do anything to help Israel. So America probably won't even be a player at the end because they will be rendered powerless and still remain an ally, but will have no power to do anything. But all these other nations are getting more and more and more power. Are you reading? And listen, I'm not one who, the news is 24-7. But I do pay attention to it because I want to see how it lines up with Scripture. Because I listen to these people in the news across the board. doesn't matter what news channel. And it's so funny to listen. Say, do you guys know you're talking about the Bible and you don't even know it? If you would just read the Bible, you'll see that you're, lining up, you're saying things lined up with Scripture. Folks, when you take a newspaper and put it out there in front of you, listen to the news and set it in front of you and open up the Scripture, my goodness, it's lining up. How in the world could they know this? And, th and this, was, this was written 2,000 years ago. It's, you you want to read the newspaper tomorrow morning? Don't bother. Open your Bible. There's your newspaper. There's your message. There's what's happening. There's what's going to happen. Just read the Bible. Listen, you know, when, when I read that scripture in Revelations, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Do you know what that meant? We're supposed to read the book of Revelations. We're supposed to read the whole Bible. We're supposed to read the... He put it in the Bible so we would read it. He put it in the Bible so we would know what's going to happen. And I know there's a lot of symbolism. There's a, parabolic, a parabolical teaching. There's symbolism and analogies and, and literal. And I understand all that. But we have to understand John on the island of Patmos was seeing this through the eyes of the future. He didn't know how to describe warfare like tanks and jets and rockets. He talked about the fire in the sky. That's how he could define it. He didn't know that there were going to be. He could, could define jets and all that stuff that we have today. But everything that he said was going to happen is happening. And some of it is yet to Oh, the worst part is yet to come during the seven years. He was defining what's going to happen in the seven years. Folks, this is going to be horrific. So after seeing this chart in the scripture, what do you think is the most important, is most important today as you move along from this day forward? What could you possibly think is the most important thing? Now, I want you to think. I almost gave you a three-by-five card today. Uh, you know my history here. I like to do all kinds of crazy things up here. And I almost gave you a three-by-five card and, and wanted you to write down what would you think is the most important thing from this day forward? Because I, I know that we have to work. I know all kinds of things have to happen in life. So I, I put my wife to the test this week. I said, honey, what do you think is the most important thing we can do as a Christian. She said, witness. Evangelize. Folks, the most important thing we can do from this day forward really is evangelize. It's a subject a lot of times people don't want to hear because you know why? Well, number one, they don't think they have to. Some say I'm too shy. Some say I don't know enough. Some say I'm scared. Some say I don't know what to say. We have all these reasons we don't do it. And, and by the way, in the meantime, all these people are going to hell. 
because we have reasons why we won't do it. And ladies and gentlemen, that's got to change. Here, here's my philosophy for many years in the ministry. I, this is how I, I taught this from the pulpit. This is how I believe and still practice it to this day. Here it is. Every time we went a soul to Jesus, we just took an influence from away from Satan and put an influence into the kingdom of God for God. Every time we bring one person to Jesus, we take influence away from Satan and give influence for God to use that person to reach another person. In Ezekiel, I'm going to go to the Old Testament for this in Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 11 through 15. It says, as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. You know, it says at least two times in Scripture that God created hell for Satan and his angels. I'd like to challenge you to find one Bible verse, one Bible verse, just one, that says he created hell for humans. Now, there's humans that were going to go to hell, unfortunately, there's humans already in hell, unfortunately. But there's no words in Scripture did it say he created hell for humans. It says in Scripture he created hell for Satan and his angels. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Well, how does this happen? How do we turn somebody from their wickedness? How do we do that? Son of man, give you people this message. The righteous behavior of righteous people will not save them if they turn to sin. Did you hear the first couple words there? The righteous behavior of righteous people will not save them if they turn to sin. Nor will the wicked behavior... Listen to this one. Oh, by the way... Don't take your applaud away, because that was very encouraging from earlier. But, you know, it says here, nor will the wicked behavior of wicked people destroy them. Not only do I got to be careful about making bad choices, but I can be careful that wicked people out there aren't affecting my behavior and changing me. And, and, and by the way, here's the tough one I was going to say a moment ago. A lot of people don't read the book of Revelation. Well, I'm finding out a lot of people don't read the Old Testament. You better read the Old Testament, folks. I know, I know. First nine chapters of Chronicles, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget. So I know, I know. I've read it many times over the years. I'm just about done reading the Bible through again this year. But I'll tell you what, if we could grasp the wealth of the Old Testament, we could understand the wealth of the New Testament. Read your Old Testament Bible. Read it. Look at this. Nor will the wicked behavior of wicked people destroy them if they repent and turn from their sins. When I tell righteous people that they will live, but then they sin, expecting their past righteousness to save them, then none of their righteous acts will ever be, will be remembered. I will destroy them for their sins. God hates sin, folks. God hates sin. So uh, I, imagine coming to church on Sunday morning, feeling righteous, being righteous, but going out and deciding to live a life of sin. None of the righteous things I've ever done will be remembered. I will pay the price for my sin. For the wickedness. And suppose I tell some wicked people that they will surely die, but they turn from their sins and do what is just and right. For instance, they might give back a debt or security, return what they have stolen, and obey my life giving laws, no longer doing what is evil. If they do this, then they will surely live and not die. The bottom line is, he's speaking to the unrighteous, he's speaking to the righteous. And what the theme of this is that God does, he wants to. Deal with the sin in our lives as believers, and he wants to deal with the sin in the lives of the unbelievers. He wants people to be ready because, as said at the beginning, as sure as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. That's not what God wants. You see, there's another power at work in our world. And Pastor Ryan gave a brilliant message 
series on Ephesians. And when he got into Ephesians 6, I told him, I said, Ryan, when you preached on the uh, armor of God, and I've preached on it and taught it for years, I said, that was the most brilliant presentation. It was a beautiful presentation. It was fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you got your armor on still. That, that's, you, that, that was the no messing around message. I hope you got your armor on because I'm telling you, with what's coming, we're going to need it. What's coming in the near future, we're going to need it. You know, I remember saying those things in the pulpit next door in the church over there for years. I said it over here in the new facility. I've been saying it for years. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for what's coming. Get ready for what's coming. Get ready for what's coming. Do you think Satan wants you and I to warn people of the future? No. That's why we can't be afraid to know what it is ourselves. And we certainly don't want people to be unaware. Because, you see, this is what Satan wants. Satan wants us tired, bored, sickly, busy, scared, overwhelmed, distracted, discouraged, defeated, hurting, worried, nervous, in denial, and self-absorbed. That's what Satan wants. And I could put at the end of that, etc., etc., etc. Because if we think this way, live this way, have this feeling, we're not going to go out there thinking that we can do anything for the kingdom of God because we're too busy with us. We're too busy with me. When am I going to get me out of the way? When am I going to let God do what God can do in me so I can rise up with a little bit of time we have left and do something to warn people of the future? I remember reading the story of martyrdom stuff over the years, and one lady uh, was threatened of her life. They were going to shoot her if she wouldn't denounce Jesus. She said, I tell you what, you'll have to shoot me because I can't denounce what's in my heart. <laughs> I can't denounce what's in my heart. And so, and, and yet the other, the other thing, we had a missionary in the Assemblies of God who was put out in the middle of a desert somewhere, a field somewhere, and he was put in a chair, tied to a chair. They put a bomb underneath his chair because he wouldn't deny Christ and stop preaching the gospel where he was. They blew up the chair. When the smoke settled, there he was sitting in the chair alive. And he walked away. So there are, there are, that's a true story. It's in our archives in the Assemblies of God. So there are times when the Lord will let a person's life be spared, and there are times when he says it's time to come home. The bottom line is, folks, the bottom line today is one simple theme. Are we ready? And what will we do to let others know to be ready? What proof do you want that it's not happening? I'll give you the proof. Here it is. How many people have approached you in the past week to offer you Jesus for salvation? How many people in the past month, in the past months, in the past year have offered you the message of Christ? Now, I've been in Dover for 42 years approximately, honey, 42 and a half years. And listen, I am not exaggerating. I am speaking the truth. A lot of people didn't know me from Adam. More people know about me now today than they did then because, you know, 42 years and preaching and being public and out there and et cetera, et cetera. You get to know people, and they know you. But a lot of people, there's still, there's still thousands of people who don't know me from Adam. In 42 and a half years of being in Dover, I'm going to put up how many have approached me and asked me if I knew Jesus as my Savior. Are you ready? Not one. Do you want proof that the church is not doing its job? Ask yourself the question, how many have approached you in the last year and say, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Let's just shift for just a moment and before we close. We're going to close. What do the following have in common? Thank you for the music today, Pastor. That was beautiful especially the one about the invitation of Jesus. 
Isaiah 55 says, says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Proverbs 7, 14 says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, I say. Wait on the Lord. Daniel 6, 10 says, and this was at a time when there was heavy persecution. Now they got together to conspire to take Daniel out of his rulership. He was like second highest ranking person. They wanted him out of the way. He, the Bible says he was the man, of, Daniel teaches he was a man of integrity. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. So they thought they could get him by making a declaration that no one could pray to their God for a month. Well, Daniel goes back home, opens up the window, as was his practice, and he prayed. And he got thrown in the lion's den. And when the king came to get to check on him the next day, there, there's Daniel petting the lions or something down there. They were doing something together, having fun. But the ones who conspired against him were thrown in the thing. The Bible says them and their family and their children were crushed. Their bones were crushed before they even hit the ground. These were vicious lions until God shut their mouth. And see, God can shut the mouths of the lions out there. But he doesn't want our mouths to be shut. He wants our mouths out there declaring. But three times a day he prayed. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come unto me and what? And I will give you rest. Do you know that list I gave you of all the things that the enemy makes sure that's going on in our lives? You want rest from all that? Come to the Lord. That's what the invitation was in the song today. Come to Jesus. Luke 10, when Mary and Martha were together, in fact, uh, I preached on that the last time I preached here. I mentioned Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And when Martha says, Lord, she's not helping me here. I got stuff to do to serve you supper. She's just not doing anything to help here. And Jesus said, but only one thing is needed. Could you walk out of here today with that phrase in your head? (laughs) Would you do that? Could we walk out of here with that one phrase in our head that Jesus said to Martha? But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. What was Mary doing? She was sitting with him, chatting, communicating. Could we all walk out of here with that ideal in mind today from this message? Let it be a takeaway for you. But only one thing is needed. To be with the Lord. John 15, 1 through 7, sum it up. It said this, abide in me and I will abide in you. And I will abide in you. And then James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. What these all have in common is that they're all invitations and or examples of coming alongside with the Lord and being alone with the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, come on, come on. And I'm not saying you're not. I just don't know. You don't know me. I don't know you, what we're like when we leave this place today. I know what I do. I know what I practice. You know what you do, what you practice. Just make sure that Jesus is in the middle of everything we're doing. I'm going to show you that next week. We got more for you next week on that. It's super time to get serious as we face the future. Jesus is coming soon. Soon can be five years. Soon could be two years. <clears throat> Soon could be tonight. All I can tell you, folks, is it's time to be ready and get our families ready. Get our children ready, our families ready. Prepare them for what's coming. So just a couple takeaways here. Pay attention to the times from a biblical perspective. Please go home <laughs> this week and start reading the book of Revelations. Yeah, wake you up. You would not want to be left behind. And let me tell you something. Be very careful. Be very careful. Be very careful how you talk about other people. Because God does not wish hell on anyone. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your, your, your workers. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your enemies. Those, the Bible says that pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray, don't talk about them. Don't talk against them. Pray for them. Because if Proverbs says God can change the heart of a king, he can change the course of a river, then God can change the hearts of our enemies. For one reason, and for one reason only, so we can know Jesus as their Savior. That's the highest priority of the church. Get people to know Jesus. 
and let God take care of the rest. Let's concentrate on what God wants us to concentrate on, and God will take care of the rest. Don't be afraid to face the future. Don't be afraid to be put in a chair with a bomb on you. You may make it through. Don't be afraid to have a bullet put, put, put up to your head if you don't deny Jesus. You just get to heaven sooner. That's all. I know it sounds like a terrible thing. I'm not making light of it, but ladies and gentlemen, this is the times in which we live. We've got to be ready. And we've got to show the love of God in that respect. Number two, get along with Christ and fill your soul with his presence. And again, thirdly, make sure you are ready. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need you as we've never needed you before. And we just pray, God, that we can get some understanding today out of this simple message that it's simply a timely message of the times that we are living in. Let us not be afraid to study the word. We need to study Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Matthew. We need to study Luke. We need to study Revelation. We need to study these books of the Bible that told us what's happening today is happening 2,000 years ago. Spot on. It's because you don't make mistakes, because you don't err. Lord, help us to walk out of here being aware that the one thing we need is more of you. And that, Lord, you will help us to be a witness in this community. We thank you and we praise you and we love you. And anybody here that doesn't know you, Lord, all they got to do is say, Lord, I need you. Or, Lord, I need to come back to you. I need to get my act back together. So help me, Lord, to get my act back together to you. And, Lord, I accept you as my Savior. Forgive me my sins. And everyone prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.